Hola amigos, ¿qué tal? It's Joe here from Spain Speaks with the Spain News update. And Spain once again finds itself in a high risk situation as far as COVID-19 is concerned. But more about that in just a moment. Firstly, a big thanks to all of the people that left comments on the last video. Lots of comments, lots of debate happening there as usual. Thanks to people that supported the channel through a donation. You can see your names here. Thanks to people that bought merchandise. And a big thanks to my patrons on Patreon for your continuing support. Now, let's get into the news. And as I said, Spain now in a high risk situation for COVID transmission as the incidence rate continues to rise. As we can see here, Spain enters high risk of coronavirus transmission as incidence rises to 305. Spain has entered high risk of coronavirus transmission as the incidence has risen to 305.57 cases per 100,000 population, an increase of 15.47 points since Tuesday. In addition, intensive care units in 17 territories are at pressure above the recommended threshold, 5%, in some cases with high percentages close to 20%. The rise in the cumulative incidence occurs after the long weekend of the Constitution on the eve of Christmas. Experts have been warning for days about the risk of increased transmission of the virus and have asked to avoid crowds. From Friday until Wednesday, 70,220 infections have been reported. Although we are vaccinated, this does not make us invulnerable, warned the scientist of the Spanish Society of Public Health, Jone Ojeda, on TVE. So high risk COVID-19 transmission again here in Spain, and this is now the sixth wave of the pandemic so far. But fortunately, no talk of restrictions like we had last year, for example, when the autonomous communities here in Spain shut their borders. Now, as we all know, one of the main ways that they're trying to control the spread of the virus here in Spain is by asking people for COVID passports or COVID certificates before they enter places like bars or restaurants. But in Benidorm, hoteliers are complaining of a loss of customers due to coercion of the COVID passport. The entry into force of the compulsory use of the COVID passport has not gone down well with the hotel and catering trade in Benidorm, who see it as coercion and also denounce that it is causing them to lose customers in this crisis dragged down by the pandemic. The president of the group of restaurants, Cobreca, Pablo González, lamented that the hospitality industry is manipulated and mistreated as a profession by imposing the policing activity with customers. This latest preventative measure against the spread of the coronavirus, decided by the Generalitat Valenciana, represents another turn of the screw for this economic activity, according to González. We are and continue to be the sector that has been most mistreated by political decisions, during this pandemic. So it seems it's a situation of damned if you do, damned if you don't down there in Benidorm at the moment, with hoteliers complaining that they have to ask customers for a COVID passport. So what's better, closing the industry down altogether like they did last year, or asking people for a certificate? That's the question. Now, Madrid Premier Isabel Díaz Ayuso is making headlines again today. And yesterday, she criticised the opposition party Podemos by saying that asking a communist to understand data is like asking a Neanderthal to understand the internet. Ayuso said this in response to a question from the spokesperson for Unidas Podemos, Carolina Alonso, during the session of control of the government in the Assembly of Madrid on whether the budgets for 2022 are going to achieve the economic revival of the region. Ayuso added that it is going to be very difficult to explain to Unidas Podemos that the budgets are used to pay for public services and with liberal policies the economy is reactivated, more revenue is collected and public services are paid for. She also stated that Madrid is registering the best data in the historical series, the GDP has grown two points more than the national average and it is the community that receives the most foreign investment. So no doubt those words from Ms. Ayuso yesterday will improve her ranking in the list of the most influential politicians in Europe and showing that she has has quite an acid tongue by saying that communists have no idea how to read data. Now, former Spanish King Juan Carlos I is also making headlines, and again for all the wrong reasons. As an English judge has called on Spain to confirm whether emeritus King Juan Carlos is still part of royal family. The rivalry between the two legal titans who are arguing their cases this Monday in the Royal Courts of Justice in London pointed to the gravity of the subject under discussion. Sir Daniel Bethlehem, QC, a former legal advisor to the United Kingdom and Israeli governments, 
was representing Spain's former King Juan Carlos I. James Lewis QC, a former Chief Justice of the Falkland Islands and a key figure in the legal case against Chilean dictator Augusto Pinochet, was there to represent the emeritus king's former lover, Corina Larsen. Judge Matthew Nicklin was overseeing a preliminary hearing that will conclude today, Tuesday, and which will have to decide whether the former Spanish monarch still enjoys immunity against prosecution. This is a fundamental question that must be resolved before the lawsuit filed by Larsen against Juan Carlos I for alleged harassment, illegal monitoring and libel can prosper in the British courts. So does former King Juan Carlos I have immunity against prosecution or not? That's the question that they need to work out there in London. And both parties involved in that court case, the former king and his former lover, Karina Larson, with very powerful legal teams. I'm not sure what the hourly rate of a QC of that caliber would cost, but I imagine it's in the thousands. Now some population statistics for 2020 were published yesterday, and the news was not good. As we can see here, Spain's birth rate continued to fall in 2020 with a 5% drop and mortality increased by 18%. The COVID-19 pandemic raised the number of deaths registered in Spain to 493,776, 17.93% more than a year earlier, according to the final data of the natural movement of the population statistics compiled by the INE and published this Thursday. This is a total of 75,007 three more deaths than in 2019, a figure that practically coincides with the 74,839 deaths attributable to the COVID-19, according to the data that the INE itself published just a month ago on deaths, according to the cause of death. Births, meanwhile, continued their downward trend and fell by another 5.35%, to 341,315. In total, 19,302 fewer babies were born in Spain than in 2019. If we have a look at a couple of graphs associated with this data, we can see on the left the number of deaths in Spain over the last decade, and on the right the number of births in Spain over the last decade. So fairly clear the impact the pandemic has had on this country when it comes to births and of course deaths. Now, as we all know, the government here in Spain announced last week that they're going to start vaccinating children between the ages of 5 and 11. And this is how the vaccination of children will be carried out in each community. Vaccinodromes, schools, hospitals and health centres. On Monday, the autonomous communities will begin to receive the first doses of the paediatric COVID vaccine to immunise the 3.3 million children aged between 5 and 11 years in Spain. After having administered more than 77.5 million jabs to the older population, the wheels and now in place. Some will revert to disused vaccinodromes, others will be confined to hospitals and health centres. At least three introduce a novelty this time and will make use of schools for injections, Valencia, Extremadura and La Rioja. The vast majority of the autonomous regions plan to start the process on the 15th. As has been the case with minors who have already been vaccinated, authorization will be required from the parents who will have to make an appointment in most of the regions. Now let's have a look at a summary of the health situation in Spain and we can see that accumulated incidence rate now up to 305.57. Hospital pressure has increased to 4% and there are 5,479 COVID patients hospitalized around the country. When it comes to ICU pressure, it's currently sitting at 11.3% and there are 1,041 one COVID patients, unfortunately, in ICU. If we have a look at Spain's main COVID hotspot, Navarra, we can see that the incidence rate there is just under 1,000 at 956, and ICU pressure in that autonomous community is just under 20%, at 19.5. Now there was some good news yesterday when it comes to using a mobile phone in the European Union as the EU decided to extend the abolition of roaming to 2032. The European Union has agreed to extend the end of roaming until 2032 so that calls on mobile data consumption when traveling to another EU country will continue to be free of surcharges as has been the case since June 2017 when the current regulation came into force. It was then decided to review the initiative after to five years and the provisional pact of the EU institutions will allow Europeans to continue using their mobile phone under the same conditions contracted in their tariff even if they are in another EU country. In addition, citizens will have the right to surf the internet at the same speed they have contracted in their country of residence if networks are available, which is currently not always the case, as according to the European Commission, 33% of consumers have experienced poorer quality when traveling abroad. So bad news for the telcos, good news for consumers. And what an absolute ripoff the concept of roaming was 
before 2017. Now let's have a look at some of the comments from previous videos. One here from Dell. Anyone know if UK passport holders can cross the border from Gibraltar to Spain? Yeah, Dell, thanks for the comment. And I'll open this question up directly for the community because I'm sure that people out there will have more information on the topic than me. But as far as I know, the border between Spain and Gibraltar is open and people are allowed to cross the border freely. In fact, Spain's borders with other countries, for example, Portugal, Andorra and France, are also open. So I don't think you'll have any trouble crossing the border with a UK passport, but you might have to show proof of vaccination. But as I said, if anybody out there has more information on the topic, please let us know in the comment section below. One here from Elke, did you drive or fly to Almeria for the long weekend? I hear flights are as cheap as 50 euros. Yelki, thanks for the comment, and the answer is that we travel by car, some 550, maybe 600 kilometers from Madrid to Almeria, and we went via Castilla-La Mancha and Murcia. We left early in the morning to avoid traffic, and we didn't run into any traffic until we hit Murcia, and that Mediterranean motorway. Lots of traffic in that part of the world, and it wasn't until we got past the Granada turnoff that the traffic started to die down again. So an interesting trip by car passing through four autonomous communities here in Spain. One here from Murray. Hi Stuart, I enjoy your videos, but think for the San Jose one, you needed a white reflector as your face was really dark in the shadow. A white tablecloth hung on a stepladder would also work well. Cheers from Manchester, UK. Yeah, Murray, thanks for the comment, and I apologize for the quality of the video that I did last Monday and I realized that my face was hard to see. I had something blocking the sun and the light conditions were difficult to control. However, you did have a fantastic view of the Mediterranean Sea and the town of San Jose behind me and the sound quality was quite good. So two out of three ain't bad. One here from Gary, Asher starts the night, very exciting. Please give Granada Cricket Club a mention. We are building a ground and a community of people from all around the world. Yeah, Gary, thanks for the comment and a big shout out to the Granada Cricket Club. And you're right, the Ashes Cricket Test Series did start the other day and what a fantastic first day it was, at least for the Australians. But as cricket fans will know, Test Cricket is, as the name suggests, a test and maybe the English or the Poms are working their way back into the test. Time will tell. One here from Jonathan. I have a list of baseball expressions which I use in some of my classes. Many people don't realize how many expressions in American English come from baseball. Yeah, Jonathan, thanks for the comment. And obviously in relation to a comment that we saw from somebody the other day that criticized me for using an American sporting expression, curveball, I think it was, when I should be using cricket expressions because I'm Australian. And I said that a lot of these Americanisms are slowly working their way into general English use around the world. Curveball, home run, hit the ball out of the park, and did you get to second or third base on your date last night? So you're right, there are a lot of baseball expressions used in English nowadays. In fact, there's a lot of sporting expressions in general. And finally, one from David, crisis always hurts the poor and the middle class people, but the rich have no crisis at all. They always enjoy their lifestyle. Yeah, David, thanks for the comment and referring to an article that we saw the other day about how the rich here in Madrid are spending like there's no tomorrow and helping the economic recovery. And you're right, with every economic crisis, the rich get richer and richer and the poor and the middle class suffer the most. But that's the system that we're in. On that note, I'll wrap the video up. Questions and comments, please leave them in the section below. Debate the video out as you normally do. Give it a thumbs up if you liked it, thumbs down if you didn't. I'll see you in the next one. Hasta luego.